I think there's a vulnerability in terms of the arts having a group think mentality. And, and, and going back to that idea, you can be in fashion or out fashion. And it feels like it very much has become a bubble. And it, it, it's sort of regurgitating the same ideas with the same people. And people are so terrified of being ostracised. They're so fearful. And it's so incredible because like the issues keep shifting. And how, how do you know that what you say next isn't going to be the thing that they attack you on. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Rosie Kay. Rosie, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. Happy New Year. I think we can still say just... <laughs> we can. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Um, the last time you were on the podcast, we talked about your personal experience of cancel culture, uh, some listeners will know that you are an esteemed choreographer and that you lost y- your role at your own dance company, the Rosie K Dance Company, after you committed the heresy of expressing gender critical views, um, the biologically correct belief that there are men and women and they are quite different. Um, we can come back to some of that uh, in a bit and talk about the that issue and the consequences of it. But I want to kick off with something a bit more positive, which is your response to your experience of cancel culture. You have now set up a group called Freedom in the Arts. It's pretty self-explanatory. It sounds like it's a movement that wants to uh, 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 fortify and expand artistic freedom. But could you just let us know what Freedom in the Arts is, why you've set it up, and what you hope it will achieve in the contemporary climate? Sure. So um, together with Denise Farney, uh, who is the woman that you may have heard of. She was a relationship officer at the Arts Council and uh, she was accused, similarly to me, of transphobia for defending women's rights in a staff meeting. Anyway, she she won uh, an employment tribunal. She and I together uh, had been doing quite a lot of work together. Both she supported me, I supported her, but also we'd started to become some kind of a fish, unofficial agony arts to the to the arts world. And while that was brilliant, there's only so far one can go uh, using your own name or using your own reputation as an individual artist. Um, we felt that we needed to find some kind of umbrella organisation together so that we could do it, not just speaking for ourselves, but speaking on behalf of other artists. So that was really the sort of starting point. And we've got three really clear, simple aims. The first is to support artists that go through those very um, disorientating and stressful cancellations. And I think artists are particularly, you know, very vulnerable. They're not they're not used to kind of dealing with maybe getting legal advice or, you know, just dealing with the press or dealing with uh, how to protect themselves. So there's that part of it. We're not giving a le- legal advice, but we can point them in the right direction. Uh, the second is to really articulate why freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience is so important. Not, you know, in the widest sense for a functioning, healthy democracy and healthy society, but absolutely for the arts. Like it's it's the place where we test these ideas, debate, discuss. And in the realm of the imagination, you need to have freedom to explore taboos and question ideas and question authority. Um, the third is to, I suppose, one way of putting it would be to hold institutions to account. But I like to put it a little bit more softly and say we, we'd like to support organisations in navigating this really difficult time, really difficult terrain. You may think that you've got one issue correct, but then the next issue will come along and you may, you know, as we've seen recently, you know, geopolitical situations across the world, world throw up very different issues and can divide your artists, your employees, and your audience. And I suppose I'd be really looking for arts organisations to start to uphold more of a sense of impartiality. That I think it's very, I think I would like to protect artists' ability to have political views, have political opinions, not to be cancelled for that. That can be difficult. That means upholding sometimes views that you don't like, you find offensive or controversial or even abhorrent. Um, but really supporting artists, but making sure the institutions and the organisations are not becoming political themselves. That That's really what we're trying to do. 
Brilliant. Uh, that's a, a fantastic outline. And um, I think one of the most exciting things that's happened in Britain over the past few years has been the emergence of different organizations and groups that are trying to claim back freedom of speech and claw back freedom of speech and, and freedom of thought from the kind of swirling climate of cancellation that we've all seen and some of us, uh, including you, have experienced. Um, you know, on the women's rights front, there is Sex Matters, there's Fair Play for Women, which is related to women's sport. There's Let Women Speak, of course, Kelly J. Keene's rather um, grassroots uh, confrontational movement, which I think plays an, a really important role too. And then on freedom of speech, there's the Free Speech Union, uh, which I think does great work. And now there's Freedom in the Arts. And there are other groups as well. And I think they all play a really Im important role in challenging dogma. But one thing that I think people will be surprised about in relation to your work and your experience is that I think there's probably a view amongst certain sections of the public that surely the arts are pretty free. You know, this is a world in which, you know, everyone is familiar with things like the Turner Prize or, you know, certain um, eccentric artistic expressions in modern Britain where it sometimes seems that anything goes and you can, you know, rip up orthodoxies and uh, you know, put an old fence in an art gallery and everyone will give you a round of applause. It seems quite anarchic and raucous and it seems like people can almost do what they want. But that's not the case, is it, at all? Especially when it comes, as you say, to what artists are allowed to think and what orthodoxies they are allowed to challenge. So how bad have things become in the arts world? Is it is it becoming increasingly conformist and difficult to express unorthodox views? It's been a bit of a shock, actually. I think it's it's been worse and has been getting worse than I anticipated. I kind of ended up really at the sort of very front spiky end of it two years ago and really did have a sense of hope that by speaking out and speaking out early in a, in a way we could really hold on to something and, and, and save the arts, I suppose. So I, I know so many good, decent passionate people in the arts I thought that people wouldn't stand for this but actually it's it's still coming in and it's still coming in strong which is quite surprising I'd have thought people would start to read the 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 legal the the lawfare that's going on at the moment but that's not the case so so I've got sort of a couple of you know uh, explanations as to why that why I think that is uh, the first is um the vulnerability of artists themselves, and and I know I mean that from a real sense, material sense. In uh, their jobs are very vulnerable. Uh, there's very little sort of employment law, uh, very poor contracting. A lot of the power, the money, um, sits within those organisations, and the and the artist kind of has to sort of respond to that. And you know, you can go out of fashion anyway, like you could be cancelled anyway. Um, so this is adding like another layer onto artists vulnerabilities and they want to succeed and they want to earn a livelihood. So there's that. The second is that the funders have been putting this sort of criteria through the system for quite a long time. And we do have a kind of unique hybrid model in the UK that's neither based on independent philanthropists nor a fully state funded sector as in Europe. We've got a kind of mix of the two. And over the past, particularly past 13 years, where it's been very fashionable to say, you know, every meeting you go into, you're going to hear fuck the Tories, that an ideology that started it as probably in opposition to sort of right ideas of right wing ideology and in opposition to austerity has morphed into something that has become incredibly DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion heavy. And again, artists aren't daft they are going to go towards where the funding is in order to make their work but now that's gone through so many years that the artists are complicit in that and they're and they're feeding that information through you only need to google uh, queer arts and arts council funded applications and and you'll see how widespread that is which is fine if there were also the gender critical artists if there was if there was a debate there but but it's gone very much in one direction um and then I think I think there's a vulnerability in terms of the arts having a group think mentality. Um, and, and, and going back to that idea, you can be in fashion or out fashion. And it feels like it very much has become a bubble. 
And it, it, it's sort of regurgitating the same ideas with the same people. And people are so terrified of being ostracised. They're so fearful that that's now becoming its own sort of like industry. And I don't think that's particularly attractive to audiences. So, so in the long term, I think it's a very destructive place that the arts have got themselves to because it's going to alienate any independent thinkers, any new ideas, and it will alienate their audiences. You know, I think what you've said there really captures um, a a contradiction or a seeming contradiction, perhaps it's not a contradiction, at the heart of the arts world in 21st century Britain, which on the one hand, it does look like it can appear like an edgy part of society. As you say, you know, they will say, fuck the Tories, or uh, they will display all sorts of expletives, all sorts of um, risque imagery and so on. That, That still happens in the arts. But then if you come along and say, I think a man can never become a woman, you are cast out like some heretic from the medieval era. There's a really extraordinary um, thing going on, a contradictory uh, uh, process. And it's really brought home to me by the issue of gender more than anything else. So we live in a country in which school kids can be read to by a drag queen called Flo Job. Now, <laughs> call me an old fashioned prude, but I don't think a drag queen with a name like Flo Job uh, should be reading stories to kids. I think Flo Job can be doing adult entertainment in the clubs and so on. Absolutely. Um, that happens. If you raise a peep of criticism about it, you are denounced as a kind of prudish, Mary Whitehouse, probably religious type who's, who just wants to shut everything down. But then if you were to go into a school and, uh, I mean, you specifically or any woman were to go into a school and give a speech saying, um, you know, 13-year-old girls, don't bind your breasts, don't um, go on the conveyor belt of gender transformation, be proud of your bodies, go through puberty, it's wonderful to be a woman. I mean, it would be in the newspapers. It, you would be denounced uh, uh, from uh, the pulpit of the, of the uh, commentariat. So there is a, especially on gender, there's this very strange process, isn't there, where art galleries, and you will know this uh, from the Tate Art Gallery, for example, which handed over a lot of its work recently to um, a, a drag queen event, all of those things can go on and everyone nods along and applauds. But if a woman turns up and says, I'm a woman and, and that person over there isn't, they are denounced as uh, contemporary heretics. How do you explain that confusion over the gender issue in particular in parts of the arts world? Well, I think what I take it back to is, is asking the question, is, is this art and does this have any relevance in an art gallery? Is this pushing forward visual arts, theatre, dance, uh, aesthetic theory. No, it's not. So what is it doing? And if you ask those questions, then I'd like to sidestep some of those other issues that I think other people are doing really, really well questioning the, the gender stuff. But saying, you know, really pulling it back to that articulation of what are the arts meant to be doing here? And and, and tell me, if you do think it really is advancing the arts, what, you know, what, what is it doing? How is it doing it? And why are you doing it with that age group? Like, what, what's it doing? I, I think gender's like one of those hot buttons, but actually I've been thinking about, like, how many landmines there are in the arts. And, and this will be across, you know, you'll understand from other parts of society, but it's particularly sensitive in the arts. I think, you know, the trans women are women, trans women are men, non-binary is valid. But the Tories, capitalism is bad, uh, anti-colonialisation, free Palestine, sex workers work, um, affirmative practice is the norm, uh, don't like meritocracies, don't like um, hierarchies, you've got to work in a collaborative way, anti-excellence, anti-skill, anti-expertise, it's got to be accessible, it's got to have community engagement as its core, and then there's, I think there's a few fringe ones like this, there's an anti-meat, there's a vegan movement, um, there's a lack of understanding, that, like just dismiss, dismissal of governance, due process, law, and then the big one that's also coming through in the arts that you're all going to start to see soon is climate change. Now, the, the interesting one, why I end on climate change, is that the Arts Council are involved in a bit in that one. It's, it's called environmental responsibility, and it's been kind of coming through for quite a few years. But can I be really honest? Like, like quite a lot of the arts is quite wasteful. Like, like we put up a big show and we do it. <laughs> we do it for cheap. And then we 
strike it and and we might recycle some of it but you, you can't always you know so that there is a kind of waste you you're meant to try and recycle absolutely everything everything's to be reused we're meant to travel on you know not fly anymore which is really really hampers international collaboration and international touring but for the first time i've started to see that actually there's a criteria coming into the work itself so we're meant to start putting in climate change messages into our work um, and then that's being written into the mission vision and purposes of the organizations so there was an international uh, organization that I, I had I had a look at their their mission and they're just rewriting it because there's been a new uh, funding round to say that um, climate change had to be like their number one priority and I just pushed back and questioned them and said but you're an international touring organization are you going to take 30 dancers from south africa and slow boat to do a uk tour no you're not so you've got to be aware of what those some of those contradictions are in your mission and there just seems to be such a blindness and hypocrisy around that and i i i really worry that that's again going back to you know like the vulnerability of artists you know being pushed to put a particular message in your work is propaganda that's propaganda by definition we all know that we should be picking up healthier habits, especially at this time of year. Just change your diet, they say, as if it's really that simple. But with so much conflicting information about the best way to stay healthy and only a finite number of hours in the day, making those positive changes can feel impossible. That's why I've started drinking AG1. AG1 is the most reliable daily nutrition supplement on the market. Just one scoop contains 70 high-quality ingredients, each one targeted to meet your essential nutritional needs. When it comes to protecting and nourishing your mental and physical well-being, there really is nothing better than AG1. AG1 contains a broad spectrum of vitamins from rhodiola to magnesium, which are designed to help you stay focused as you tackle the day. Imagine the benefits of coffee without the inevitable caffeine crash a few hours later. And one of the best things about AG1 for me is how much it's strengthened my immune system. Because AG1 contains ingredients like vitamin C, zinc and functional mushrooms, I'm able to keep those nasty common colds at bay, which is really important at this time of year. One benefit I really didn't expect from AG1 is how much it has reduced my stress levels. The mix of plant extracts and adaptogenic herbs helps promote mental clarity and keeps me alert and focused all day, which makes sticking to my other healthy habits even easier. AG1 has become a vital part of my daily routine. I drink AG1 first thing in the morning with my coffee and I can make it in under a minute. All I need is one scoop mixed with water and I'm set up for the whole day. So if you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to drinkag1.com slash Brendan O'Neill. That's drinkag1.com slash Brendan O'Neill. Check it out today. That's such a useful uh, and pithy way of understanding some of the problems when art becomes overly politicized and overly moralized, when, when it gets burdened with um, communicating the correct political message, whereas art ought to be something that stirs a feeling or makes us admire beauty or takes us out of the political world, in fact, and out of the world of the everyday and gives us a, 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 an experience on a, a somewhat higher plane. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because freedom in the arts, um, you make the point in your manifesto that in society itself, we still tend, for the most part, we still debate complex issues like race, gender, uh, sex, religion, climate change, and geopolitical questions as well. But in the arts world, um, very singular, unnuanced responses have been enforced on lots of those issues and other views are being shut out. I think that that how you how you describe it in your manifesto at Freedom of the Arts is will I think really connect with lots of people and how you've just outlined it there I think uh, really connects with me. Why do more people in the arts world not recognise that this is a form of propaganda, as you've just said? Why do they not recognise that pressure is being put on them um, from different in different ways, financially or just political pressure, moral pressure from the Arts Council? to communicate a political message. 
how can they not see that? And how can they not see that it is as equally problematic to be pressured to communicate a politically correct point of view as it would be to communicate the the Stalinist point of view, as artists had to do in Soviet Russia, for example, or the Tory point of view. We would all be outraged if the Tory government was telling artists that they have to do art saying that mass immigration is a terrible thing. You know, what what's going on there, do you think? Is it because they have been sucked into these orthodoxies and they actually agree with them? Is that is that what is what's happening? So in order uh, to, to, before we set up, we went public with Freedom in the Arts. Um, I reached out to as many artists that had either already contacted me or I sort of found through, you know, contact by contact by contact and spoke to everyone I could um, on all levels of experience of the arts. And one way that I really experienced producer put it was that he said that the entire arts world is a culture of fear and loathing. And I thought that was just, I hadn't really, you know, I sort of thought of, you know, Hunter S. Thompson and Fear and Loathing of Las Vegas. I hadn't really thought about that we might be living in an actual culture of fear and loathing. And it's a fear that goes really deeply. Um, and people, you know, like myself, but many, many, many artists have been used as examples. And um, it seemed like there were microcosms of cancellations that had been going on across many, many different art forms. But again, also through COVID, had been very isolated. So, you know, it, it was quite appalling when I looked at the poetry world or when I looked at the literature world or when I looked at ceramics and, you know, I had this kind of incredible insight into so many other art forms that there were little stories of horrible cancellations right the way across. And there's a loathing. There is a loathing inside artists themselves because none of them set out, you know, to compromise. Um, I think artists are very um, generous souls, quite sensitive souls. And like I said, they're, they're vulnerable. They're, they're not equipped to become political, outspoken animals. I think especially if, if say, for example, uh, if you've been accused of something like racism, it's so shocking if you've spent 20 years of your life, 30 years of your life working in, you know, minority communities, putting your poetry out there, you know, striving to just make a livelihood. If you face one of those accusations, and God forbid you face one of those public handings or Twitter handings, a lot of people just absolutely had uh, some kind of breakdown. And, and of course, other people see that, saw that, don't want that to happen to them. So they have a loathing that they're not able to speak out. And then they have a loathing of those that are weaponizing this stuff. And there is a generation of quite mercenary, well, uh, well-versed activist artists who are young and see themselves as punching up, and that our hierarchies of these old-fashioned ideas of, you know, earning your stripes and working up through the system are, um, by their very definition, oppressive, and it's their job to dismantle and. They're very strong, very powerful. Even sometimes it can just be one voice is very, very powerful. And I think the leaders at the top are fearful. There are major, major other issues going on in the arts um, around um, viability of s- sustainable finances, uh, buildings falling apart, heating bills, I mean, multiplying by 10 to 100 times what they would expect, uh, lack of funding, um, lack of good product out there, audiences not returning. And so this is a this is yet another thing that sadly I think it's easier for them to just go, oh let's let's let the young people get their way and let's hope it blows over. And they're not quite they've not been challenged to really justify their leadership positions before and and, and many of them I hope I think are, are, are waking up to this. But they are also got their eye on their audiences, and and they're just confused as to which where how to, which way to fall, which is the right way to fall. Yeah, I think one of the things that has really struck me and and many other people, of course, is the extent to which art has been bent to a moral agenda. I mean, it seems to happen in so many different uh, spheres of art. You know, in the literary world, we hear about um, morality readers who um, essentially check texts to make sure that there isn't anything immoral or shocking or offensive or or supposedly racist or whatever else it might be. 
um, to such an extent that old works of literature are, are even being rewritten, you know, the Roald Dahl books, for example, to, to expel certain words that might offend kids in the 21st century. Um, I always think it's quite funny that kids can be read stories by a drag queen called Flow Job, but they can't see the word fat to describe Augustus Gloop, you know, because that might send them over the edge. Really bizarre situation. Uh, in the film world, we have this increasing uh, claim that you have to be the correct identity to play a certain character. If you play a gay person, you should be a gay actor and, and so on. Um, and in the visual arts and the performative arts, as you've described so well over the past couple of years, there is just this, uh, everything seems to be increasingly twisted to serve a moral or political agenda. And I notice this when I go to art galleries and you see a painting or, or a sculpture or whatever else it might be. And the caption next to it just gets longer and longer. And you can see it from a distance. You can see next to the artwork, there's a huge, long, square caption. And you just know it's going to lecture you about something to do with politics or society. Uh, you know, I miss the days when the captions just said what the artwork was called and who created it. Um, so all of this is going on. And even with artifacts in museums, you know, they have been hyper-politicized. You know, certain things are hidden away in case they cause offense and Museums seem to be engaged in self-flagellation all the time for the crime of holding certain artifacts from history. So I think people get a sense that art has been invaded by um, a political program and a moral program. So I wonder if one of the things that Freedom in the Arts will do, and I'm sure it will, is, is give an articulation of what, what purpose art should serve you know, what art is for. And you've, you've, you mentioned already that you sometimes look at what's going on in galleries and you think, well, is this artistic? What is the purpose of this particular thing? So is that one of the things that you guys hope to do, which is to give a clearer sense of what art is for? I mean, it's a difficult thing to articulate, but I guess it's something that it might be worth striving for in a world in which art so often feels like a bit like a moral lecture. Oh gosh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. But, but it, but your question sort of absolutely terrifies me to, <laughs> to try to articulate and and it, you know I think it, it it speaks of this age where if 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 you can't measure it you can't manage it you know this kind of yeah. data-driven uh world that I've seen creeping up over the past 20 years and uh, you know that links to sort of the labor agenda of arts uh for regeneration or the sort of the neo instrumentalism of the arts that everything needs to be measured um and so in this way to justify the public funding artists first of all rather reluctantly started to kind of like agree that there were benefits to the arts that were outside the arts themselves but now have become willing very willing participants in sort of saying what their economic regenerative purposes are. And thus that then very easily segued into kind of this moral superiority that we, it's a very sort of 19th century uh, viewpoint, isn't it? That one goes to the art gallery to be, to be morally lectured and to be taught, you know, the, the badness of the, the I, think, I think it was the racism of the chair in the Hogarth exhibition. I thought this this can't go go on, but but it but it did, and and of course what the what you know what really got me about the Hogarth was it completely missed his incredible sense of humour and political satire. If you if you understand the work, and but nobody seemed to have looked at the actual work. <laughs> they were just reading it as, uh, and I've experienced this as well that people are reading art now as something to be deconstructed and to be morally outraged rather than that there's a there's a deeper thing going on there that 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 we're not able to sit in uncomfortability sit say in the beautiful darkness of a theater and experience and see and feel things that we maybe weren't expecting or to feel challenged and to actually be overwhelmed by something and and, and I just wonder if that that is the art's power and is it deliberately trying to be squeezed because we're unable or we find it so difficult. I mean, we will try in Freedom of the Arts to express this, but, you know, I wouldn't say at this stage I've like got that nailed. And, I, and I'm not sure I would ever want that nailed. I think there is a mystery to, to, to humanity. There's a mystery to reality. And right now, you know, that reality is under threat. And so where does that put the arts? It makes the arts actually a bit redundant um, because, we're, because there's nothing to play with if there isn't anything to play with. 
And I suppose that goes back to my, you know, what I wanted to say so early, which is what's very hard is if the atmosphere is is, is sour, uh, the, the 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 trust is gone, the the threat of cancellation and attack and ostracization is around everybody. I mean, where on earth is the the, the playfulness, the curiosity, the fun, the laughter? You know, you need to be able to kind of like say the unsayable, laugh about it, and then go, hang on, but what is that little bit of truth there that we can find a way to express in this theatre or in this work of art? Um, so the the construct of actually making really good art is under threat. Yeah, uh, I that that makes perfect sense to me. And I guess if if you're if you're always walking on eggshells, you're not as exactly going to dance around or raise your voice or jump up and down and do something daring precisely because you're on eggshells. So I think that climate is obviously not conducive to whatever it is that art needs in order to um, uh, thrive and grow. Um, I wonder, following on from that, I wonder if one of the key problems is that many people in the arts world have internalized the censor. So, um, you know, in the old days, the, the, the censor was often, was, was predominantly an external force, you know, right back to the Vatican, which would keep a list of books that you weren't allowed to uh, publish or read, right through to, obviously, Nazi Germany, which would destroy um, decadent or grotesque art, Um Right through to Mary Whitehouse. I'm not comparing Mary Whitehouse to the Nazis, just to make that perfectly clear. Um, but, you know, she would often frown upon uh, a, 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 an anti-Christian play or a blasphemous poem or whatever else it might be. And, you know, I often feel the temptation to say that we live in a Mary Whitehouse style era, but that's not actually correct because I think it was probably better when it was an external power wagging its finger at you because then you knew where the threat came from. And probably many artists responded to that by saying, well, screw you, I'm going to carry on doing what I think needs to be done. Whereas I think what's more insidious about today's climate, as you've described and and as you guys have been talking about, is that lots of artists have internalized the need not to say certain things or only to say the right thing and only to examine the right topics, partly because they know that's how they'll get funding, but also probably because that's what they think they should do. That's what a responsible artist does. He, he or she um, embodies the right opinions as defined by a certain section of society. So doesn't that leave us in a really difficult situation where rebellion itself becomes almost impossible because, you know, the, the censor, the modern day Torquemada, the inquisitor is now inside the artist's own mind, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I just absolutely agree. Um, like I've got some of the evidence to, that that backs that up now. Um, it's very much a culture of self censorship. Um, it's very much like, um, okay, what are what are your distinguishing identity features? Well, that's what you can make work about, and you better not stray out of that 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 sort of very narrow lane. And, uh, you know, where, again, where is the sense of humour, the playfulness, the, the subversion, the, the, the trickster of subversion? Um, because, if, and also there's that really weird thing where everything's transgressive, isn't it? It's a bit going back to your, the drag queen, like there's this extreme transgression, which actually has become the status quo, which is like quite confusing for artists, I think, as well. I, I knew of an artist that had very, very, very carefully constructed a piece that very gently mocked um, this idea of saying the wrong thing. Um, And I'd had it checked, had it checked, had it checked, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. Came to the premiere, one person took offence, one person complained, that complaint spread and their entire tour was cancelled. This is an older, very experienced uh, artist. Um, And then through sort of supporting this artist, we discovered that a certain theatre had um, its own uh, what you can and can't put on stage list, a secret uh, content list. Of course, we can't get our hands on it. Um, And of course, you think, well, yes, in this day and age, there would be. But that actually genuinely really horrified me because this really is a McCarthy age. I mean, mean, I I, I was lucky enough to sort of study artists, um, like artists that sort of, came out of Nazi 
Germany or, 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 or uh, Eastern Europe under communism. And, and I think you're right. There was that sense that because it was coming from the top down, artists could be incredibly clever about um, subverting the, the, the rule book. Um, one thing I think of is, is the way that Polish artists used symbolism um, to fight against um, the communist agenda. And, and some were really successful and some would get caught out now and again. And then I think post-McCarthyism in the US, it might have taken that, you know, another 10 years or so, but that explosion of realism in 70s cinema, I feel like was some kind of reaction to those kind of codes. So I, I always just try to kind of keep a little sense of hope that artists will find ways where I feel we are is, is, is if enough artists sort of do something that that's good but that's not going to make much of a difference we've really got quite a big problem with the institutions and the organizations and the gatekeepers like I'm really I really thought there'd be more uh, uh adventurous spirits actually that that would that could see like we've seen in new media actually that there's an opportunity here that there's a that, that out of this might grow a really exciting new movement with some incredibly brave artists. We might not like all of their art, but we're going to see something kind of coming out of this era. It, it, we're not there yet, but I, you know, I, I, I stay an optimist. Hi, it's Brendan here. I just wanted to remind you that you can still buy my book. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto: Essays on the Unsayable. And I've really been blown away by the response to it from readers, reviewers, Spike supporters. People really like this book, and I think you're going to like it too. It covers all the insanities of our time, from climate change hysteria through to COVID authoritarianism, through to the trans ideology. And it basically makes the case for more freedom of speech, more debate, and more heretical thinking to challenge the conformism of our times. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon right now and order my book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And now on with the show. Yes, I think optimism is essential these days. Otherwise, we'd all go mad. I, I, I feel I flit between optimism and pessimism, but usually I'm optimistic that just as with new media, as you say, you know, other things will open up. It's got to happen at some point. Um, I wanted to ask you about... Uh, the idea that cancel culture is a myth, or, 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 or I guess really, what cancel culture is like, what what it really represents, what it means. When I think about um, egregious instances of cancel culture, I do tend to think of some from the arts. I think of um, Roisin Murphy, uh, the great Irish singer, uh, who I've been a fan of for a very long time, and um, you will know that she was at least threatened with cancellation, and reportedly some of her gigs promoting her album last year were called off and and the promotion of her album was um, a toned down because she made a private comment on her private Facebook page about the threat posed to young ch- kids by puberty blockers, which is a threat recognized by many experts in Europe and around the world, that these drugs are dangerous and have a potentially destructive long-term impact on kids. Um, and for that, she was demonized. She was called a turf. Lots of her um, uh, fan base said, we're not going to listen to you anymore. Really horrific stuff. It was great to see that her album was a roaring success regardless of that. So that's optimistic in its in itself. And then the other case I think of is, is yours. I very often think about your case of cancellation. And I do cite it to people if they say to me, cancel culture um, doesn't exist. I, then, I say, well, then explain to me how the choreographer, uh, Rosie Kay, was cancelled from her own dance company for making comments at a private dinner in her own home to other dancers um, in which she questioned the idea that a man can become a woman and defended the idea that women should have their own spaces in which they can get changed and have a private moment and so on. You know, if cancel culture doesn't exist, then how does someone like Rosie Kay face cancellation for saying something that the majority of people will agree with? So there are some very egregious examples of cancellation in the arts world. Yours is one of them. Um, give us, give us a sense of what it's like to be in the eye of that level of a storm, because this was obviously a dance company that you had built up over many years. And then you find yourself having to leave it because of the extraordinary, well, I guess 
the 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 culture of fear and loathing that you mentioned earlier and and the unwillingness of people in the arts world to work with you because of your gender critical views or your perfectly normal views what's it like to be in the eye of a storm like that and does it still impact on you now do you find yourself waking up at five in the morning and thinking i can't believe the bastards did that to me what what what's the current feeling that you have about that kind of experience yeah, you're you're right. There is a little bit of like having come out of the other side of it, just kind of go, what? Yeah, fucking <laughs> <Okay>, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a bit of me that's like, how dare they? How yeah. dare they? Yeah. After all that, that was ridiculous. And of course, you know, the vindication is through all these legal cases and all these horrific examples and the downfall of Nicholas Sturgeon, you know, yeah. every week, <laughs> every week that's something, yeah, yes, you know, but you can't, again, also, you can't let it eat up your life. And, you know, to go back to sort of like having studied these, these really, you know, fascinating periods of art history, to kind of go, oh my God, not only am I living through one, I am <laughs> one of these yeah. people now. Yeah. And where else would I want to be? I would not want to be carrying alone under my desk, terrified to speak and making, you know, the equivalent of dances about kittens, I guess. I don't know what, what, <laughs> what work I'd be making. And that's not to say that it isn't easy. And, it, and um, it isn't easy. It isn't easy for me. And then when I speak and interview artists uh, for Freedom in the Arts or support artists for their cases... You know, I'm 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 shocked all over again, and sometimes I'm I'm you know on a Zoom or a phone call with artists, and I'm literally like I can't believe it, and then I think to myself, yeah, but it happened to me, so so I guess that's why they can trust me and why I can kind of really actually give them practical advice, but it is yet still so unbelievable, and it's still going on. So, so I mean, the financial stuff is really big, and I, I did um, lose a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money. Um, I haven't publicly said how much, but I was regularly funded, and I'm not anymore. And so that's, you know, year by year, a huge amount, and my productions were big and on a large scale. Um, and I had a salary, which stopped the day I resigned, um, the cost on the mental health um, is huge. I have one artist that says she's convinced she's lost five to ten years of her life by the stress, and I, she was. I don't think she's joking. Like the your cortisol levels are very high, and so you're sort of in a state of um, threat and attack and fight or flight all the time. Um, I know an artist that had to move house because she could no longer live in the city that she adored. Um, of course, there's the cancellation and, and the deplatform. At least, though, then that's obvious. You know, if you've had an offer and then it's rescinded, what's much uh, more difficult is that kind of silent cancellation where you're just quietly dropped, or people no longer return your calls or emails, or your or people that did support you suddenly just sort of stop supporting you. I think that's the stuff. The ghosting is um, hard on your psychology. And again, you know, artists being very vulnerable, it, it, it's not a world where we're all really well off and we can just sort of, like, it's not some amazing philanthropist that's just out there chucking money at artists. We all have to find out uh, ways to sort of survive. Um, I suppose though that thing of like, you, 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 are, you either stay silent and it goes internal or you speak out and you keep speaking out. And you keep finding new ways. I, I mean, I think I've got to be in the in the former camp. Um, I suppose one other thing is is, is it does pre it does push artists to maybe have a a longer period of reflection. Uh, sometimes artists have retrained um, or take a lot of time out to read and to think before they come back. Uh, a lot of artists were on a treadmill before COVID to survive. This has sometimes forced people to kind of you know have an inward desert time. To really rethink. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that something will come out of it. But yeah, the costs are very, very real. Um, yeah, that's the way you put it is, is so stark and so true, which I guess is that someone like you and there, there are others as well. The choice, I suppose, is to buckle under and agree to nod along as, you know, I guess in your case, as, as the, the male dancer undresses in front of female dancers. I mean, this is how, this is what we're talking about. 
to nod along to that and say that's fine, even though you don't think it's fine and you think women's equality entails women's privacy and women's dignity, to either jettison your moral beliefs uh, in in uh, and stay on side or make that break and do something new and different. And I think lots of people are very pleased that you made the break and you, you now have set up Freedom in the Arts and are doing um, some other brilliant work as well. Um, I just, just on the issue uh, that led to your cancellation in particular, I just wanted to ask you a question on that um, because it's an issue that I find very interesting as well. I write about it, I speak about it, and of course you have for, for some time too, which is the issue of I, how would one put it? People call it gender critical views, but I prefer to call it, you know, the world of reason and understanding that sex exists and that women's rights are important and that these things should not be thrown in the dustbin of history just because some men believe that they are women. I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about. And I wondered if bringing in your own experience and, um, your own pushback and the pushback of other women as well. You know, Britain is often referred to as turf Island because we have an outsized number of turfs, um, trans exclusionary radical feminists, or as they are derogatorily referred to. Um, do you, th- does that give you a sense of optimism? The fact that Britain does seem to be a country in which there is a more, a healthy, quite colorful, quite daring, pushback against this new ideology, whereas in America, it seems to be much more cowed in terms of the imposition of this new idea. In European countries as well, some lots of people have rolled over and accepted the idea of a, a post-sex anti-reality. Does that give you a sense of optimism too, that there is a pushback here? There are new movements. There are lots of women raising their voices and staking a claim to their own rights and also to truth itself, I guess. Yes, yes, I do. And you're right. It is a really um colourful world uh, and there's such amazing women and and I think they all have like you know different niches different expertise and I I I, I think it's really inspiring that they're, they're, it's very inspiring I think the whole kind of like um heterodox kind of community if you will you know um I've met such incredible people and people that have had to sort of go through each person has had to go through that moral choice um, and and come through some sort of like asking yourself some deep questions about what, it's almost like what you will and won't fight for, you know, which hills are you going to die die on? And, you know, once you decide like sticking to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that, that that's been a real silver lining to all of this is the incredible particularly incredible woman I've, I've met, but, you know, I'm not complacent. Um, I think there is, it's a widespread, um, well-funded, well-organized movement to the, and there are reasons, there are deeper reasons as to why sex is being dis- deconstructed, why women's reproductive rights are also being, I think I said it last time I was with you, actually, there is a, there is a through line around women's rights across the world that is being attacked. I'm very interested in what the next elections in the UK and the US um, may offer us or may push back and making sure that we speak to the right people and we lobby at the right level and we offer support um, is going to be really important, I think. So, yeah, watch this space, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, and one of the, I guess, one of the contradictory things that is coming up over the past couple of years is that some of the political forces that are very um, critical of the trans ideology are also quite committed to the idea that maybe women shouldn't work and maybe their place is in the home and maybe they shouldn't have as much control over their own bodies as, as, as they think they should have. So there is this uh, difficult thing going on where some people who would consider themselves allies of the gender critical idea are also not really allies of women in other areas of women's lives. So there's that thing that I think is always worth being vigilant uh, in relation to. Um, I did want to ask you just one quick question on politics, which you mentioned there. And um, you mentioned earlier the fall of Nicola Sturgeon, uh, which I think was a a positive moment in in 2023 for Scottish politics and for for women in Scotland, actually. Um, I wonder, what, what do you think a good minister for 
the arts would do. I mean, if you look at someone like Kemi Badenoch, for example, who I think is doing really good work in relation to the idea of women's equality um, and also in relation to the idea of gay rights and not putting young gay people on a conveyor belt of sexual correction, as it's uh, sometimes referred to. She, she's standing up for uh, equality in the truest sense that um, gay people and women should be able to live in society without feeling ashamed or cancelled or, or threatened. Um what would a minister of the arts do if Rosie Kay had her way and maybe even had the ear of this person? Uh, what do you think are some of the solutions that they could put forward from the top down to tackle some of the problems that you guys at Freedom of the Arts have, have clocked and, and spoken about? So my first um, call would be around bringing back serious Nolan principles into things like the Arts Council, really making sure that we understand impartiality. I think that's the starting point because that that kind of then informs everything that comes down from there. I don't think you can even have conversations about excellence in the arts until we understand impartiality. Um, and, and that's actually, that is so vital. I don't think things are going to get cooler. I think things are going to get hotter um, around the geopolitical issues of the world. Um, so, so understanding impartiality, understanding early principles, understanding arms lens, but that means that organisation needs to be like looked at and held accountable. Um, I, I, I really do think that some of the problems in this country are coming from the top down in terms of the funders, and we're not going to change the landscape of the arts and the artists themselves and the work that they're producing until we change that, which seems a bit contradictory from this conversation, but actually it really is true in terms of like the way our system works. Um, the other sort of the flip side of that, which is something that Freedom and the Arts, it, we are super, super aware of, but we're not going to like tackle in our first year or even our first two years of existing is the whole education pipeline and um, what's happened to arts education particularly over the past well it's actually the past 10 years has dropped off a cliff in terms of like free provision of music dance theatre um, ability to kind of go to theatres to see work um I'd really want to kind of like look at that because that's that's a whole economy thing where not only are you inspiring young people, you're offering um, new skills, new expertise, um, you're actually also supporting the art sector itself because those matinees and those performances are a really big part of the economy. Um, and then really, I mean, I would be having a look at the arts education and I think that's a real, we've got a real, a bit like the whole academia situation we've got hotbeds of ideology that are training artists to come out as activists and not as experts in their arts field and so we have a pipeline issue in that we're going to kind of keep getting this kind of activism like I say you know with, with, where is the quality of the art what does it do to further the art um, we're going to be getting that because these artists I'm sorry don't have the skills um, and so having a look at some of that art training would be really important as well. Yeah, sounds good to me. And who knows, in a decade's time, maybe we'll all see better art as a consequence. Okay, my final question for you. Freedom in the Arts describes itself as a, a five-year emergency plan. Not a five-year plan, but a, a, a fi in, the, in the old authoritarian sense, but a five-year emergency strategy to deal with some of the problems that you've been outlining there. But it also, isn't it part of a broader necessary push not only for artistic freedom, but for freedom of thought and freedom of speech more broadly. I mean, I know that you've done work with the Free Speech Union. Um, we at Spike have been writing about the issue of freedom of speech for a very long time, 20 years or more. Um, there are other movements growing up that make the same case. And it, this fundamentally comes down to the question, doesn't it, of, of whether it's better to live in a free society or an unfree society. And I'm often quite shocked still, even though it's been going on for some time, I'm often shocked by the number of people who, even if they don't say it outright, seem to prefer to live in an unfree society or a safe space or a kind of cosseted culture rather than one in, which is free and maybe a little bit dangerous. So this is about, um, I think, celebrating not only liberty, but also some of the unpredictable, risky consequences that come from living in a society that is free and it's so incredible because like the issue keep issues keep shifting and how 
if you advocate for, you know, the, the offence-free system, the safe system, how do you know that what you say next isn't going to be the thing that they attack you on? And it, and if they're attacking reality, like the biological reality of men and women, we could all have to start to say that the sky is green and you'll be prosecuted if you say it, it, it's blue. <laughs> so, so this is this is the this is the whole sort of like problem of authoritarianism that if you, we've only got a short window actually. To, it feels like to 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 fight back. I think it's democracy and freedom is, is is kind of in our bones. It's in our DNA, but it isn't something that comes completely naturally to people. And I think somehow. Um, fighting for something feels a bit sort of gauche or seems a bit, seems a bit, well, that might be a bit violent. Whereas actually when you're fighting for principles that are about, you know, equality and democracy, then sometimes you do have to fight for them and you do have to kind of like stick your head above the parapet and, and, and say, no, I'm not having it. And I suppose that's what Denise and I sat together and when we've already had to put our heads above the parapet, let's do it fully. And even just by doing that in itself, we're saying, no, we're not having it. You know, and then out of that needs to come all, all the next stages that, that we'll do. And, and, and I, I had this idea of it only being five years because, you know, I do want to continue to make art. I've got lots of things that I felt I was absolutely on course to be doing. And I want this to be a blip and I want to put my energy and my time and focus towards it, but not forever. And we'll either we'll either win, and I'll be able to carry on and make my wonderful work again, or we'll have lost. But at least we'll have the evidence as to why we've lost. It won't just have crept upon us, and we can't say in later generations nobody tried. You know, Rosie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.